Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for the second event in CESEP's 2024 Mega Election Year Series. I am your Dom CEOL. I'm the founder and CEO of CESEP. CESEP is a nonpartisan nonprofit organization. We are working to counter authoritarianism and advance inclusive and resilient democracy. We pursue our mission by building a pro-democracy cross-country ecosystem for learning, collaboration, and innovation. And one of our impact initiatives is the Global Democracy Champions Network, which is focused on facilitating timely conversations across border to exchange ideas, lessons, and tactics. In today's discussion, we will delve into the political power of women and young people by unpacking lessons from recent key elections in Argentina, Indonesia, and Poland. Before I welcome the event's moderator and panelists, uh, I'll just spend a few minutes providing a brief overview on the election outcomes in each of uh, the three countries. Let's start with Argentina. In November 2023, Javier Millet, a self-described political anarchist, won the presidential election promising a new era of economic policies. Millet's rhetoric and policies mirror those of the United States' Donald Trump and Brazil's Jair Bolsonaro. Former President Donald Trump, in fact, has shown solidarity with Malay, referring to his campaign as Make Argentina Great Again, a pun on Trump's MAGA slogan. Post-election analyses show that Malay was propelled to victory by three primary factors. First, a predominantly male youth movement that expanded to include all age groups. Second, frustrations with Argentina's high inflation with a peak at 211% in 2023. And third, an alliance with the political traditional right. Finally, in Argentina, it's important to note that the latest analysis show that male voters between the ages of 18 and 25 are more conservative than any other age group and are showing the largest ideological gap between men and women in the country. Next, let's move on to Indonesia. In February, 2024, Prabowo Subianto, a controversial former army general and defense minister, won the presidential election. Indonesia, which is the largest Muslim democracy in the world, has a majority young population with Gen Zers and millennials accounting for approximately 60% of the electorate, which translates to about 114 million people. Subianto's win has been attributed to one, his successful ability to recast his image from a military strongman to a cute grandfather using traditional and social media, and to the appeal of Subianto's campaign new image. In fact, Subianto's new image with young voters, many of whom were after the military dictatorship era. And, and finally, the third reason that has been cited is the endorsement from the outgoing president, uh, Jokowi. Lastly, let's turn to Poland. In October 2023, Poland ushered in a new political era, defeating the conservative Law and Justice Party after eight years in power. The election witnessed historic voter turnout of nearly 75%, the largest since the fall of communism in 1989. This has given much needed source of inspiration for pro-democracy champions all over the world. And the success of the opposition to law and justice is largely attributed to two reasons. One, an effective mobilization of women and young people. And two, the creation of a diverse political pro-democracy coalition that brought together the political left, center, and right. Despite law and justice having significant advantages in the media and its entrenched political influence, Poland demonstrated that victory is not only probable, but also possible. So we have three very different um, contexts across three continents, but also really interesting trends among them. I've shared the facts, and now we'll get a chance to hear from the actors from each of these countries who will shed light on what happened, what we can learn from these elections to inform upcoming election preparations. A couple of logistical notes before we get started. One, if you haven't already, please choose your preferred language option. Uh, we have obviously the, the discussion is happening in English, but we also have Spanish translation available. We will start with the panel discussion, and then we, have, we will have dedicated time for Q&A. So please feel free to add your questions in the Q&A function. We also invite you to share your comments and, and reflections in the chat. We are recording this event, as you likely have noticed, and, and we will share the link with you afterwards to uh, share with your networks. 
And then finally, I ask that to foster an inclusive virtual environment, um, let's all commit to sharing comments and questions that, that are respectful to all. So with that, I'm thrilled to welcome the moderator for today's discussion, Sadia Sindhu, the Executive Director of Center for Effective Government at the University of Chicago. Over to you, Sadia. Thank you so much, Giordanos. Um, thank you for the introduction and the context setting and the opportunity to be a part of this really critical conversation. I look forward to moderating today's discussion. Um, I'm also honored to be joined by three women who are experts on the context of Indonesia, Argentina, and Poland. Joining me today um, is Natalia Herbst from Argentina, the Director for Latin American Strategy and Development at A Political Foundation. We are also joined by Afu Utami from Indonesia, the co-founder of Think Policy Society, and finally, Kasia Batko from Pol Poland, who is the program director of the Citizen Network Watchdog Poland. As uh, Jordanos had mentioned, we have 40 minutes for this discussion, and we'll have about 10 minutes towards the end um, for Q&A. So I'd like to get us started with just asking a sort of context. First of all, I'd like to get us started by inviting all of my um, panelists to join me um, on the Zoom. Great. And then um, I've got a question just to get behind some of the statistics. Um, I'm at the University of Chicago, we love statistics, but our conversation here is really to provide some context beyond that. So whether it is a historic voter turnout since the fall of um, communism in Poland or the largest youth voter bloc in Indonesia, I'm hoping that each of you can um, share what has mattered the most for women and young people in each of your respective countries. And what did these groups do to shape the election outcomes? Um, Kasia, why don't we start with you? So thank you, thank you very much for this invitation. I really feel that I have a lot of a lot to share in a short time. So uh, generally, this is the the fact that women and young people went to elections is connected with the poli politics that was run by the um, Law and Justice, this party that was ruling for over for eight years, but also thanks to the mobilization of political parties and civil society. And the main reason, what, what was the this something that kind of mobilized people is that um, for women, it is pretty clear this is abortion law. Uh, law and justice in 2020, trying to avoid political uh, accountability, decided that they will direct, so because they had their constituency lobbied them to change the abortion law for a very restrictive one. It was already restrictive, but the church, which is naturally a base, like people in a church are a base, Catholics, traditionally thinking people are a base for the constituency of law and justice. And the right-wing organizations were challenging law and justice to change the abortion law. They did, They wanted to avoid that. So they, because earlier they subordinated constitutional tribunal, so they thought we will do it with hands of the constitutional tribunal. They will say that even this very weak protection of women is too much and women shouldn't be protected. And they did it in 2020 in autumn when there was COVID, they hoped people will not go for the street and they went. And this was one of the biggest revolutions that mobilized huge number of people. And it also kind of, this was about women of all ages, but also this young women for whom this was like personal story uh, and who for the first time expressed such an anger. And of course they could, for when there were comments after that, uh, whether it's going to impact the elections or is it really a change, the um, experts were saying, we will see it on the election day. And in June, 2023, we had elections in October. In June 2023, there was research made that below half of young and uh, young adult women want to go to the elections. And this is the second part of the mobilization when uh, civil society started to do plenty, but really plenty. There was above 30 campaigns to mobilize uh, women and then women, young people, different groups, but among others, women and 
uh, and young people and they mobilized them successfully actually after the research made after the elections proved that over 50 percent of the society respondents but of course this was representative research uh, of the responders respondents said that they encountered one of the messages in the civil society campaigns. So we also see that it can be one of the lessons learned that there is like not one main message, but diverse with different messages. All we know, it made the, it created the situation when not going to elections was kind of a failure, life failure, while in the elections before, because we had different elections before, it was something for which young people were really young people, women, it's difficult to say, but for sure young people who are usually not voting or the, the frequency is much lower, were not engaged, they didn't feel it's for them, they didn't believe that. But anger connected with everything that happened, because I don't want to take too much time, there were also other factor, factors like inflation and arrogance and, and the fact that the generation has changed. These were young people who were born in the EU, many of them. So also, you know, eight years is a long in, in the life of such a young uh, group. So so for them, this was something dif difficult to accept that they are ruled by traditional or elderly men. <laughs> we can say that. Yes, no, thank you so much. This is the excellent context for us to better understand. Um, Afu, turning over to Indonesia, same question. Um, can you share what mattered most for women and young people? And how did they, um, how, how did they, how will they shape election outcomes? Sure. Yeah, I'll just start by putting out the context that uh, youth in Indonesia can be put in one big block, uh, simply because we're very diverse. Uh, we're an archipelagic nation with uh, five large islands that's very, you know, far away from uh, one another. And uh, we're also very diverse just in terms of, um, you know, uh, how many of youth are urban, but uh, the rest actually, in fact, the majority uh, are still non-urban, living in, you know, coastal areas, in villages, um, and so on. And therefore, we're also very diverse uh, in terms of values. So um, unlike in other countries where uh, there's a correlation between age and maybe a level of progressiveness, for example, um, here it's almost, um, you, you can say almost 50-50, uh, you know, the, the group of youth that register as, you know, more uh, conservative uh, leanings uh, versus progressive. So let's start with that, right? Uh, but it's also important to look at how youth have changed in the past, um, you know, 25 years since the uh, Reformation in 1998, uh, the end of the authoritarian era, and how we have changed both in terms of um, the uh, economically, but also socio-politically. Um, economically, in the past, uh, you know, uh, uh, past decades, uh, we have the middle class has grown significantly. Now there's over 20 million something middle class and over 115 million aspiring middle class, uh, as the World Bank would categorize them. And this means that universally. Uh, many of young people uh, care about economic stability and economic opportunities and prosperity related issues, right? This means jobs, access to education, job opportunities in general, um, and, and so on and so forth. But there is a group um, in terms of sociopolitically, this um, inequality of access to education actually creates um, kind of a, 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 a tangent uh, uh, between young people who are who tend to have better access to education and therefore tend to care more about very progressive issues. This includes environment, uh, environmental issues, uh, uh, you know, freedom of expression, um, uh, corruption. Um, actually, corruption is uh, relatively universal for for all youth. But uh, but there's this chunk of of young people who, who uh, with really progressive messages and really uh, concerned, especially on climate change. Seeing that in the past decade, there's plenty of uh, laws that have been uh, passed that are not necessarily in favor of stronger environmental protection, for example, um, and so on. So there is this kind of, uh, you know, almost maybe two or more, uh, uh, you know, sets of, of, of group that, that are voting for uh, different issues. But most importantly, I think like the underlying uh, challenge that we face is uh, sociopolitically because of lack of very strong civic education, there's a general apathy 
uh, where, uh, you know, young people in general, uh, of course, there's like a very progressive, uh, you know, group that have, again, better access to education and what have you. But in general, young people do not directly link uh, the issues they care about with uh, the political system. So they would talk about, you know, economic issues, challenges to find jobs and what have you. And many surveys have proved this um, in, 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 during throughout the election. Uh, but this doesn't necessarily translate into voting behavior. And what we have observed, and uh, I think uh, Yordanos earlier and you as well uh, have provided context, uh, there's a larger chunk of young people who actually vote uh, based on likability, uh, first and foremost, uh, just in terms of which campaign is actually more entertaining and more relatable um, in terms of pop culture uh, and what have you. And, 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 and a big chunk, again, because uh, uh, half of uh, the, the young voters are actually Gen Z first, First time voters and a majority of them access their information primarily from TikTok, for example, they have this reality that is built around social media content. And when one of the candidates flood uh, the social media content uh, with, uh, you know, alternative realities where they talk about uh, not necessarily issues, this uh, tend to have a significant buy in uh, from, uh, uh, you know, a, a big group of young people. And again, this all relates uh, back to, um, you know, lack of or like not so strong civic education uh, that has been happening in the past few decades. And this is exactly uh, the initiative that we're, um, we have been promoting, uh, Vote Wisely is trying to fill in, basically doing, you know, providing the alternative space for civic and political education uh, for mainstream uh, young people so that you know, we can catch up on how, you know, politics is actually relevant uh, and it should be based on the issues that young people care about. Thank you, Afu. Um, Natalia, turning to Argentina, we'd, we'd love to hear what you, what you, what you would assess as uh, most critical there. Thank you so much, Saria, and thank you, Kesev and the other panelists for uh, the invitation and being here today to have this great conversation. Um, in the case of Argentina in particular, I think it's key to look not necessarily at what they chose as Javier Millet as a proactive like uh, decision, but at what they rejected. So if you are between 15 or 29 years old in Argentina, you were either born on, or you grew up after the 2001 economic crisis. It was a massive economic crisis in this country. And since, since then, two coalitions were in power, one for six years, like in different terms, and one for 17 years in throughout different elections. And during that period, all indicator worsened. You have families with two generations that have been living in different aspects of, of informality, relating to work, relating to access to housing, uh, basing their livelihoods on cash transfers. So you have to come to see this decision from that standpoint, in my uh, opinion, uh, in the past, during that time, youth were mobilized for a decade by one of these coalitions around the significance uh, of human rights uh, based on our post-dictatorship transition. And that really created a sense of belonging for a while, but it wasn't enough to talk about the past if you weren't able to, to offer prosperity in the present and the future. And I think that's what led to Millet to being an, a, a appealing, um, an appealing option. If you listen to interviews uh, during election night of people that were around uh, the place uh, where the Millet campaign was based, uh, they were being very reasonable. Like you heard to voters and it's not like voters were coming with very strong uh, anti-rights discourse. They were basically saying like, I've already tried with everyone else and everyone else has failed me. I'm doing worse every time I choose someone else. So I want to see what he's able to do. So I think in that sense, it's like harsh for, I've worked in government for a long time. I support pro-democracy candidates. So it's it's a time to stop and realize that voters are being uh, rational and reasonable and to think about what democracy has been offered, has been able to offer so far and how it's been able to connect to voters in uh, particular contexts, particularly post-COVID to reframe and think how we can do things differently. Building on Afu's comment, I think in our case, uh, apathy doesn't explain this voting. We, uh, since the return of democracy 40 years ago, we've had a round of or over 80% of uh, turnout on every election. So people are going to vote, but I think in our case, it's more, uh, it's explained mostly because of frustration or distrust. 
Um, particularly around uh, young people, I think there's a, a, a particular point that's relevant and that connects to strategies around organizing or how what to do around elections and not just during elections. So just to give a little bit of context, the way in which elections are organized in Argentina is you have a first round, which are primary votes. It's simultaneous. So everyone goes to vote on the same day. Everyone is registered and you can vote in one primary, but in any primary. You, you, it's, you're not limited to vote on the party in which you are registered. So it's a little bit like counterintuitive. So you go into a voting station, you have ballots for every party and you can vote in whichever uh, party primary you want. Uh, in that election, the vote was split in thirds. So you had Millet coming first, which was a shock, but with 29% of the vote, the second and the third uh, candidates got 28 and 27. So it was very even the distribution. And then you had another 10% distributed among smaller political parties. The next round, which is the general election, Millet got the exact same amount of votes. So what you could see there is that his voting base was not elastic. He wasn't able to uh, gain new votes in that round. And obviously he won in the runoff. We, we had like a, a runoff because nobody had enough votes on the first round. And in that round, the person that came in second on the primary election gained almost 9% of uh, extra votes. So what you can see there is that his voting base is very inelastic. And as you pointed initially, it was originally very focused on young uh, male voters. And something relevant that came out uh, this week is that we have uh, an updated uh, index of uh, gover uh, trust towards government. And it's very surprising because the context since Millet came into office, office has also worsened. The economy is going worse. And it's part of his platform. Like when uh, asking for a vote. And when he got into office, he said, we are going to make, we, we as a society, we are going to need to make a lot of efforts for a while so that improvements come, uh, reach us like in the coming months. Um, and I think because he came in with that discourse, the trust towards the government uh, only decreased very little. But when you unpack how different age groups uh, relate to this index, uh, the decrease uh, in trust towards government is explained completely by the 18 to 19, 29 bracket. So only young people are losing trust in government and older people are keeping trust. I think that is probably explained because they have already experienced successive economic crisis, older people, and they know that there's no easy fix. But for young people, this is not the same. And I think this is really interesting for two things. One is that I want to see how it will play out in the midterms next year. Obviously, we've only been into this government for three months. It's very, it's a very like short amount of time, but it's interesting to see that his uh, voter base is not satisfied with the policy so far. But I think it also gives us a lesson in terms of like organizing, right? Usually like people who organize to, around elections or candidates or campaigns, like we have a peak of work around elections and what I'm seeing now is that the first 100 days after the election, after he's actually in office, should be the moment in which uh, pro-democracy organizers should, should be working the harder because there's probably a lot of disenchanted voters that could be rallied around a new cause and that could be organized towards next year midterms. So it's something uh, new that I didn't have in mind until this particular uh, data came up this week. Um, and I think it's interesting to take into account for uh, future elections. I'm so glad you sh share that because I think one of the purposes of these meetings um, that CASEP has been putting on is really to learn lessons that can be applied elsewhere and perhaps not applied elsewhere, depending on the context. So with that in mind, Kasia, I want to return back to you and think a little bit about, um, you know, we know that one of the most compelling strategies employed by Poland's opposition to the Law and Justice Party has been creating a diverse coalition that has brought together the political left, the center, the right. Um, can you share a little bit about how did this coalition form? And more importantly, how does it maintain unity when you're bringing such diverse viewpoints together? Actually, this is a popular myth that they created coalition. There was a debate 
two years before elections and every elections that they should form coalition, that the only way to combat law and justice is to go together. But there was also this doubt that uh, civic platform that lost elections in 2015, that they have so, ma so many people have negative picture of them that if they form a coalition of everybody, then people have no reason to go to vote so that they will be no there will be no mobilization so these discussions were present everywhere between politicians in the media and finally the the situation was that civic platform with some smaller parties created something that is called civic coalition but it was more or less the same liberal community then the left was the left and it was pretty clear from the beginning that the left goes alone and then there was this third uh, phenomenon that was a composition of something that was created by tv presenter who started to be very active and uh, new person in politics, knowing how to communicate with people, and one of the traditional parties, Peasants Party. So this was old and new in one uh, group, and they, they called themselves Third Way, and they didn't want to join civic uh, civic coalition, which was pretty similar to them. Like they were more like conservative, but generally liberal community altogether. And uh, finally, they didn't agree. But a few weeks before the uh, elections, they stopped competing and they started to cooperate, knowing that if any of them will not enter the parliament and this third way, this was a coalition. So for coalition is 8% threshold. And in 2015, law and justice won. Only like they were the first ones. No, even they were not probably the first ones. Anyway, they had like 30 something, 37% of votes. But because the left didn't enter the uh, the parliament, law and justice took their mandates. And this is why they were, they were so powerful so everybody was afraid of the repetition so that now you know this third way created a coalition and they are going to lose and everybody and now we have like again law and justice only because of this you know tactic so at some point the leaders of civic platform that was the first one civic coalition started to play together but this was in my opinion this was their maturity that they decided more important is that we all enter the parliament and of course they were also declaring we are going to uh, co um, co um, coordinate our efforts but voters had the choice so who wanted to vote for the left could vote for the left and you know for the leading party they could uh, vote for the leading party and i think it worked very well but also there was kind of the extra points for this third way because at some point also voters mobilized themselves and they started to save them like go, they went to vote for the third way because they were afraid according to uh, um, to the pre election polls they were not reaching the reaching the threshold so they start voters st started to vote for them just to let them in and uh, they achieved quite a good result. So they believe this was the support for them. That, that, but this is not very clear. We will see, we now have in a week, we have the local elections. And okay, now they are a coalition, but we see that there are issues where they cannot meet. Abortion law, this is one of them. Of course, they can say it's difficult because we have president from the law and justice, he has to accept. But generally, we see that there are differences that are difficult for them. So only being against law and justice and being afraid of them coming back keeps them together. But because of the elections, they also have to be different. So now they are quarreling. We will see after elections whether they are again united. So, you know, this is a historical moment when uh, it's difficult to say what is truth and what is not. But I didn't mention that there is also one right wing uh, coalition and Natalia when she was talking, not coalition, but there is right wing extreme uh, party that was supported by young people during the summer last year, 
it was like they had 14%. And young male were supposed to vote for them, but also women. And it somehow changed in the last moment. They started to lose and um, probably because they didn't have anything else to offer, just saying freedom, free market. And of course, for some people, it was um, attractive, but generally we somehow managed to show that world is a bit more complicated. So, so somehow, somehow we escaped, but they are waiting. Thank you, Kasia. Uh, Natalia, this is perfect because my next question is for you. <laughs> um, so in Argentina, the traditional right has, um, which initially underestimated Milay, um, ended up building an alliance with him. How can you tell, can you tell us a bit about how this transpired and what this means for the future of the conservative movement in Argentina, which continues to, it seems to be highly appealing to young men. So just help us better understand that. Yes, thank you so much for this question. I think this is a very uh, complex, or, or not complex, but it has a lot of context-wise uh, characteristics. And obviously it's hard for the like international media to sometimes uh, portray the uh, how the political landscape is uh, locally, because and mostly like in U.S. media, probably because um, it's very different when you have a multi-party system than a two-party system. How like alliances are built and how people uh, spend different times of their political careers in different spaces. So I want to challenge a little bit the characterization of the political space. Um, so basically, one but very relevant thing is that all politics except Javier Milei in, and historically politics in Argentina are very skewed to the left. So what you would call our center right party uh, in most policies would be to the left than the mainstream Democrats in the US. So just to have like kind of, or would be in the same space as mainstream democratic uh, politicians in the US to have like some sort of uh, context of what kind of policies they would uh, push for. Um, on top of that, Argentina has two large coalitions of parties and within those coalitions, each coalition has both more conservative and progressive politicians and, and parties. And a great way of understanding that is if you look at the distribution of uh, the abortion legalization vote in Congress, it wasn't a coalition, it wasn't an issue that aligned coalitions. You have people in both coalitions voting for and against. And I think that gives a clear sense of like what kind of conversations and, and kind of profiles you have within parties. I think what, in my view, what explains better the difference between those two coalitions are not the idea of progressiveness or conservatism in the classical sense that we would uh, assign to that, but one coalition which is the one that you would call like the left wing coalition here, is more associated to social justice and the defense of corporations, not in the sense of like businesses, but like corporate power, uh, like unions and uh, very uh, attached to a status quo that is rooted in corruption and lack of uh, uh, modernization of the state and uh, institutional strengthening, while the other coalition, which is the one that you would consider the center-right coalition, is more focused on social progress compared to social justice. The one is very focused on cash transfers and keeping the situation as it is, and the other one is more focused on creating a bigger middle class, uh, just that preserving the current situation and more focused on transparency policies, on strengthening institutions and trying to challenge the parts of our status quo that make progress impossible. Um, so in that landscape, the new uh, far right party like erupts based on these two coalitions inability to actually produce sustained progress uh, during their times in office. And La Libertad de Avanza, which is Javier Millet's party, is a conservative party by every measure. Uh, it challenges what we define here as the democratic consensus, which is a set of uh, cross party consensuses reached in the first decade after the dictatorship which includes a constitutional reform and a transitional justice process uh, that sentenced the military for their actions during the dictatorship. These were things that weren't under discussion here. And this party came in to challenge the economic situation, but a whole array of issues regarding rights and the democratic consensus. So 
in this context after the, the, the center right or traditional democratic. Uh, and it's important to also highlight that both, while having different profiles, though the, the pre existing two coalitions compete and have discourses that fall within the democratic margins. Okay, so they have different ways of trying to reach to the same thing, but they don't come uh, to challenge democratic norms. So after the general election, when the center-right coalition was left out of the competition, some members of the party supported Millet during the runoff and later joined his, gover his government. I think, uh, I think no, this is not the party, the party or the coalition's official position. This was uh, linked to very relevant personalities from the party, but not a, a, an official position. And again, it needs to be understood in a multi-party context in which particular people may spend different parts of their careers in different political parties. Uh, not every year, but every 10 years, they may end up changing as political parties reshape their positioning within that system. Um, and particularly, Millet came in uh, as a lone wolf. So a lot of people thought that by joining his government, they would have the opportunity to shape his agenda. So they took positions uh, in there or supported him initially because it was easier to have someone else to implement very harsh reforms. Uh, this has shown, this hasn't been the case. He's very intransigent in his positions. Uh, he has fired a lot of uh, people that joined his government like within a month. Uh, a lot of people left because they felt they couldn't do like, implement any policy, and it's only been 100 days. Uh, and he's having a very hard time filling a lot of second line and third line uh, political appointments because people don't feel comfortable joining uh, the national government. This obviously has a terrible impact on the implementation and of actual like, policies and programs that need to keep going. I think a great example of how he continues to try to polarize and how he's not getting the support he thought he might have happen again, this, this week ha has been very eventful, happen again <laughs> this week. So March 24th is the anniversary of the beginning of the dictatorship uh, in 1976 here. So it's a very emotional day, it's a day in which, it, it's a national holiday, but it's a day um, in which people uh, manifest on the streets and always have remembrance, uh, uh, rallies uh, in the public space. And obviously the government uh, is trying to change the narrative about what happened during the dictatorship. They feel uh, they are trying to create a narrative in which they put at the same level of responsibility a systematic plan by the government to uh, persecute and disappear uh, dissidents to uh, violence committed by individuals, which is obviously uh, two things that are wrong, but at very different scales. So they released uh, an audiovisual material, which was I think very poorly executed. They are usually very good at communication and it was very long and very heavy, uh, but the discourse was basically this. And what happened was that a lot of very relevant political figures that had so far supported his economic measures and were trying to give him like space to do the, his reforms came out very strongly in this conservative or like center right space came out very strongly to say, this is not another question. Like what the government is saying is wrong. We might support uh, the fact that we need to have a healthier economy and there are reforms that need to be made, but the narrative that they are trying to install is wrong. So I think that's, uh, again, a very good example of the limits that the historically uh, democratic actors are putting to what uh, the new government is trying to make, even if they are supporting him in some specific measures uh, that regardless of all other things that they may support that are not really good, may be necessary in our particular context. Thank you, Natalia. Um, earlier today, you um, shared a little bit about um, trust in government and younger folk um, in Argentina. Um, Afu, I want to turn to you and thinking about um, younger voters in Indonesia. It's estimated that 30% of young voters were born after Indonesia's authoritarian era, in which Subianto served as a general. Talk to us a little bit about that just like you know the the lack of having a personal historical context, um, and instead it's in sort of informed online. And how does that inform both online and offline messaging strategies employed to influence these young voters, which you've already shared with, are very diverse. And you know there's there's a lot that to unpack there. To even call them just young voters is not really fair. 
but um, help help us better understand that. Yeah, sure. Um, so what we need to remember is uh, that this is actually Prabowo's fifth election. So he's done this four times before. He has lost four times. Um, and so it's interesting to really pinpoint at what's different this time around, right? That led him to his, um, you know, finally victory. Um, and there's there's a few things. So you you rightfully pointed out about the lack of historical context for at least 30% of uh, the younger voters. And this is very real as we are directly interacting or we've been directly receiving feedback uh, on how people discovered for the first time his uh, involvement in uh you know in, in during their information and his like human rights uh cases from our website for the first time because they never learned it at school they never learned it from anywhere else um so that's very real uh but secondly the, the interesting part is that for many of the voters who actually are aware about uh this fact it doesn't necessarily translate into voting behavior it doesn't necessarily make them or stop them from uh, uh voting for him uh and and it, especially because basically it's out shown or like it's uh outranked by other things that they find uh as uh, really uh you know matter um and there are at least so three things in terms of the strategies that's been employed right N number one the one you know major thing that Prabowo didn't have before is uh the support from the incumbent president uh, who is very popular even after some controversial, um, uh, you know, things that, that he did, like uh, with the constitutional court, uh, uh, you know, last minute change so that his son uh, was allowed to run as the vice presidential candidate um, and so on. But he remained really popular. So President Jokowi, uh, you know, actually, you know, openly supported uh, uh, Prabowo's candidacy and, um, and, and, and gave his blessing. And it's clear because his son also was running as the vice president. Right. And, uh, you know, as a package that gives a huge popularity boost um, to Prabowo's camp. And um, not only in terms of popularity, uh, but secondly, even from, you know, putting aside their age demographic, um, you know, working with the incumbent president opens up, you know, uh, you know, new resources that can be used and sets of, uh, you know, power and resources uh, that can be tapped on to win the election. One very controversial approach uh, that he's employed, for example, was related to the social assistance program. There's a huge boost in the social assistance program spending by the government in the final few months of the election, the couple a uh, few uh, months of, uh, you know, before the election. And many have, there are some, a few viral videos showing that uh, during the, the handouts of those social assistance, there's this, you know, wrong message uh, of that if you want to continue receiving the social assistance, please vote for number two um, and not for the other candidates. The other candidates may not continue this great social assistance program that Jokowi has started and so on and so forth. So in general, like this, you know, fu fundamental uh, approach uh, uh, in terms of the popularity of the, the incumbent president as well as um, uh, the social assistance uh, really mattered, right? On top of that, uh, there is a very specific online strategy to basically rebrand uh the former general into again the, the cute grandpa right uh they very intentionally pour resources into creating thousands of content every day uh across social media platforms and uh, there are reports comparing the the uh, size of campaign funding uh, across the three candidates and it's clear that uh, uh you know Prabowo's camp has uh, you know the mo the most resources and there's a lot of analysis also showing how much content they're flooding again TikTok Instagram um and so on so uh you know first of all they use an AI generated um uh, animation that turned him literally so there's not even there's very few uh, you know photos that's promoting on like huge banners uh on on you know major roads in jakarta for example that actually shows his face there's almost none what we see is uh, an animated version like a very cute pixar like uh you know version of the general that depicts him as um again like a, a cute uh a grumpy grandpa but we love grumpy grandpas in, in in animations uh along with the vice president uh candidate so that like directly rebrand him as someone cute but secondly he's very effective in using popular um uh, like tiktok music uh or like this there's this very viral song uh that, that's his Basically, the song doesn't really say anything, but it's very catchy the way that, you know, very viral TikTok music uh, typically are. And the, it, this has been reposted. It, it, it really defines the sole 
uh, the festivity of his campaign. And for it turns out for a majority of uh, you know young people, uh, it turns out like this really works because it, it, it feels directly relevant, it feels fun and festive and so on. Uh, whereas maybe the, the two other candidates, uh, you, you know, uh, I think they still try to also have some education uh, objective as part of the campaign, the political education, uh, you know, trying to promote a different democratic culture. Uh, uh, some of you might be familiar with how the uh, um, uh, Anis, the, one of the presidential candidates, tried to uh, use a roadshow of town halls. Basically, he opened, he sat down in like a huge hall typically and had like everyone, literally anyone from any economic, social economic background, from any, you know, value, whatever, to ask him any blunt question and he would answer all of it, which is very uh, refreshing and it's uh, very, um, in a space where some would argue that Indonesia has been having like a shrinking civic space as well. So it's it's been a really refreshing, uh, you know, kind of campaign for many of the maybe intellectually leaning or like academia or like higher education, um, maybe middle class of voters. And that's uh, that basically a majority of those votes actually were captured by O1. But for the rest of Indonesia, again, seeing the socioeconomic disparity and different preferences, um, uh, it doesn't necessarily, it wasn't really effective uh, to, to turn it into voting outcome. And finally, just a short comment on uh, what I mentioned earlier, Natalia, on uh, Indonesian voters being apathetic. I, I think maybe I picked the wrong word. Maybe it's not apathy per se, because uh, it's similar. So here the voter turns out, uh, uh, turnout is also uh, quite high. There's maybe 18%, uh, which is very, you know, quite normal, like 18% of uh, no show or uh, invalid uh, votes uh, in the 2024 election, uh, but what I meant was maybe political li literacy. So people would vote uh, and people would talk about politics and, you know, just, but from the point of view of uh, which one is popular or like which one seems cute or, you know, more likable and they talk about politics, but not in a, you know, political in terms of values or uh, issue-based discourse. So this is where, again, like we need to, you know, hopefully shift it in the next five, 10 years ahead. There's uh, plenty of work to do, but um, that's the direction that I think we need to go to. So when we had started this conversation, um, and Yordana set us up really well for this because of the work that CASIP does, I want to turn to a question that I'd like each of you to weigh in on, because I think it speaks to the mission of learning across um, these international borders. Um, so we know that there's an ongoing ongoing international solidarity movement among particularly illiberal leaders, for example, between the American right and Malay and Poland's Law and Justice Party, um, Kesup's efforts and why all of us are here today is to build stronger connections across democracy champions, democracy entrepreneurs, uh, to exchange lessons and tactics and support one another across these borders. So for each of you, I'd like you to just share your top two lessons regarding the role of women and young people from your elections and what you and how you want to share that those uh, for what would you like to share for those of us who are currently preparing for our own upcoming elections. I'm pointing to myself because we have an election coming up not too far from now. Um, so Natalia, why don't we start with you and then we can move to Kasia and Asu. Great, thank you. I think this question is uh, super relevant uh, in the yeah in the context of far right candidates like Millet and like Donald Trump, etc. So I think for young people, it may be like super obvious, but you need to find them where they are, uh, and you need to see them not just as people that need to learn, but as people that are already creating impact. So make them also like inform the strategies that you're doing. So in terms of community building, feel, find them where you they are uh, in like offline spaces, but also in online spaces. For women, I have a very unpopular opinion here, but I think it's fair. And I'm coming from this from a feminist standpoint. I think um, we are asking too much from many women. Uh, women are not single issue voters. Uh, they are affected in the same way by economics and distrust as anyone else in society. I think in general, we are asking, uh, I was listening to what Afu was saying, and it's one of the things that's in, on my mind as well as like how can we have more deep political conversations with our constituencies. And the fact is that voting based on values has become a luxury for some people when you are constantly thinking about your livelihood of how to make ends meet. Uh, 
you have to be understanding of the fact that not because people cannot have that conversation and not because people don't have an ideology themselves, but it's rational to vote based on trying to survive. And once you have all your basic needs met to go into the next level of depth in terms of your, of your choosing. And I think the same goes for women. I mean, obviously women want to be safe and obviously abortion bans have a huge effect on voting, but we need to understand them as complex voters, which have more than one issue. Uh, but I think there are two other actors that are super relevant. I think pro-democracy candidates have been uh, doing quite uh, average and bad campaigns for a long time. I think we use evidence-based data and decision-making wrong. We need to use it to plan strategy and we need to use it to implement and design policy, but we don't have to go to our constituencies with a very uh, straightforward evidence-based discourse. We need to connect with their feelings. We need to understand, especially people that are being left out, who end up being more appealed by far-right uh, options. We need to connect with what they are feeling. Uh, we need to connect with their emotions. We need to make them feel that they are part of our projects. Uh, so I think obviously evidence-based decision-making is relevant, but that's not, that that shouldn't go straight forward into political communication and campaigning. If I don't know if I'm being clear, uh, but also I think, and I don't know if there are any funders in this call, but I think pro democracy funders in the pro democracy space need to be bolder. Uh, you were talking about this uh, right, uh, the, the extreme right uh, organizations being very active. Um, pro anti-democracy, pro anti-rights, pro extreme right uh, coalitions are being very aggressive uh, in supporting their candidates. They're being very aggressive in being on the field supporting uh, campaigns. They are being very aggressive on, on sharing knowledge. And it, on the pro-democracy camp, we are being very cautious and we are funding like three month pilots and seeing the, the ecosystem needs to grow. There needs to be more spaces to meet. There needs to be more on the ground learning. There needs to be longer term projects that allow people to iterate and to make mistakes and then to learn from those mistakes and do better. So I think young people and women have a lot to do, but also pro-democracy candidates and pro-democracy funders have uh, to make a shift in the way in which they are operating if we want to create a more global uh, movement that can uh, support uh, different processes in different uh, continents. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry, I, I think I froze for a second there too. Uh, Kasia, may I, may I turn it over to you for your top two lessons? And then Afu, if you could close us out with that, and then I'll turn it back to your Danos. Uh, yes, thank you. So um, I, I, if we think about young women, uh, people and women, I think that what, and this is obvious in Poland, like in 2015, young people wanted to be patriotic, wanted values, traditional values. They felt that liberal government does not give them sense of living. While in 2023, people were fed up with everything that they got. Young people were fed up with everything that they got. So in eight years, they didn't want these traditional values. They wanted to be European. They wanted to belong to the Western community. They wanted to have education abroad to like, this was completely different youth. So for me, lesson learned is that politicians should follow how the electorates are changing and society is really very dynamic and events during the term can change this society uh, very much. And with women, you are true, Natalia, that there is not like one women type, but I also uh, observed different focus groups that, of course, it may differ between countries, but I think that this is somehow connected with the human being. I focused the same topics discussed by women groups and male groups. And there was a huge difference as regards such issues like abortion, uh, LGBT, not migrants, but abortion and LGBT, women were more like they, they saw shades. They were aware that this is difficult decision sometime, 
or you may have a child that is LGBT person. While for men, it was very black and white. No, yes, like be because these were groups of the like authoritarian type of, of personality. So I think that for women, uh, like in, in case of Poland, the question was more about mobilizing. We, we, I am jealous that you have such a high turnout. For us, for us, it's always a problem. And young people are especially the ones who don't go for elections. So mobilizing them was, uh, uh, was a challenge. And um, I think, but it's, it's not proven, but I think that because they were more aware of the misinformation and propaganda, they were just offended. They felt like idiots, treated like the prop what propaganda gave them was something that they could not digest. And it was one of the things that make them angry. Uh, because like according to the research, it's not housing environment of, or mental health that is very important for young people, but it was not the thing that made them go for elections. They went for elections because they were angry, because they were frustrated and they just wanted to protest against the way how they are treated. And uh, I think that somehow something that law and justice, coming back to Sadia, to your question, law and justice learned from uh, Viktor Orban in Hungary that you can join elections with referendum that will support your case. Uh, and then more of your supporters will go for elections. This is what law and justice thought. But this, this was very tricky for him because it mobilized people. This referendum was so stupid that resistance of the society, it was inflation to say, I'm not going to vote in referendum because it was kind of a, the open de declaration that I'm against everything that happens here. So I think that like, at least 5% of the turnout was connected with the fund that people have had with rejecting referendum. So law and justice wrongly learned from the uh, from the uh, another illiberal government. Something that worked in Hungary couldn't be repeat, repeated in Poland. So, and also in Hungary, they managed to resist the referendum, but they had to put all their effort into the referendum, while in Poland it was a bit easier. So so I think that one lesson learned is that propaganda is different to different age groups and it can uh, uh, impact different age groups in different way. And that um, young people are changing, like society is changing, but especially young people because like the conditions in which they are brought up. And I also heard it in Afu's uh, presentation that she said that People were born after, you also said, Natalia, people were born after the crisis. So, so it shows that, that they are the most uh, sensitive for, for the changing uh, society. Thank you. Afu, I'm going to give you the last word um, as we head to our elections here in the US and for others on this call who have not yet voted. What are your top two lessons? Yeah, I'd like to echo what Natalia um said before which is that meet young people where they are at the end of the day sometimes we have an idealized version of how young people should be or how we expect them to be and uh, ended up creating campaigns both as civil society or as political candidates right we we build campaigns around what we want uh, the young people to be but i think what's been proven effective is really understanding where they are at the moment and and just being honest with with that reality and and creating a, an effective campaign uh, surrounding their you know at the end of the day deepest aspirations um and what's interesting in indonesia's case actually um so for example natalia earlier mentioned about how uh, meeting basic needs is the prerequisite before you can start thinking about values or issues that doesn't necessarily is the case in indonesia or at least it doesn't necessarily translate into that so part of the key um demographic that we're trying to engage is actually young um, middle class especially because we think that they should already have the economic uh you know independence and space to start thinking about values or issues but this is not necessarily the case a, a huge chunk of the middle class uh, voters actually did not vote based on issues and that's what we find really interesting and and we think and we tie it back to again lack of um you know um 
education in terms not that they lack education per se in terms of degrees but the right kind of civic education the right kind of historical context um and why politics uh political engagement is important which is which has been uh, kind of deprioritized in the education space for the past few decades because we've been focusing so much on building skills for employment, building skills for like economic skills, but not necessarily the like value and political uh, education that's important. So, um, I mean, that's the reality. And I think uh, looking around the world in the upcoming elections, um, different countries will have different realities of you know where the young people are at the given time, being cognizant about their socioeconomic uh, you know aspirations and realities is so important so that we can build uh, you know the right kind of messaging that actually answers and caters to their uh, uh, deepest um, aspirations and 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 uh, politic you know sometimes they didn't realize that it's political aspirations but. Uh, their deepest political aspiration and and being really effective is is key. Uh, we've seen that uh, you know liberal leaning candidates fail not because uh, you know they didn't have the right kind of policy platform or you know team. Sometimes they have the best um, kind of team in terms of uh, the, you know the right intellects of, of the country or, or what have you. But this doesn't necessarily always translate into being effective in campaigning. Um, and it has something to do with um, again realizing or understanding. Uh, uh, where the young people and the women are, and I cannot agree more that uh, women are not a single voter, uh, single issue voters. Um, so I think that will be really critical uh, moving forward. So that uh, at the end of the day, it's about being effective, um, not not just um, again, not just uh, you know, uh, focusing on the ideal uh, state. I think that's it. Thank you. That, and that, that that happens to be the work that um, I've dedicated my life to as well, <laughs> the Center for Effective Government. So you, you closed us on a great note there. Um, I'm going to turn it back to Yordanos. Um, Yordanos, please, thank you so much for having us. Thank you to all of you. This was such a really rich conversation and, and really appreciate you, Sadia, for your moderation and then Kasha Afu and, and Natalia for your reflections. Um, I know we're over time and want to be respectful of your time as well as everyone who's who's on the line right now. So. Uh, we will we will close um, uh, now, but would love to get feedback from you. We're going to continue with the series um, over the coming months, and and so please stay tuned for upcoming events. And also, because we ran out of time, we weren't able to get to the Q and A portion um, as as we had initially planned. So apologies to those of you uh, who didn't get your questions answered, but we will certainly follow up with the recording as well as uh, you know with uh, lifting up key insights from this conversation. So. Thank you, everyone, and look forward to seeing you uh, at our next event.